Hi, everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. Very much excited for having you. It's always a privilege coming your way on our live stream as we prepare ourselves towards the ICA November 2020 examination. And like we started yesterday, we're looking at uh, principles of taxation and taxation in general, focusing on one of the fundamental topics in taxation, and that is value added tax. So we looked at the part one yesterday, and today we're going to be concluding on it and solving some real-time questions on VAT and how to do with withholding uh, tax on VAT, because that is also another crucial or critical area for your syllabus. So I see some of you guys joining. When you join the stream, give us a thumbs up on the video. That way we get more engagement on the video. And YouTube and Facebook will be able to push the video so we can reach as many students as possible. So consider also to share the video uh, with others. And if you know somebody who wants to be part of the live stream, especially if you're on Facebook, just put it in the chat. Uh, mention the person's name in the chat and the person will be able to get a notification so we can reach as many students as possible. So welcome to the stream. Comment in the chat box any questions that you have for me. Subjects that you want us to cover on the channel. We want us to uh, look at a couple of things that we need to uh, look at and a couple of things that we need to uh, focus on on the channel. So comment in the chat box any questions that you have for me. I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you and find out what it is that you would want us to cover more on the channel. So yesterday we started with value added tax and we're going to be continuing with that today. I'm going to share my screen with you in a moment as we go through the slides on that. Remember that this lecture that I'm uh, giving on principle of taxation, the material is strictly from my advanced taxation book, which is uh, going to be released by revised advanced taxation book, which is uh, supposed to be released by now, but then because of the pandemic and all of those things happening, we need to uh, take time on it. So uh, it's going to be out very soon. Some of you guys have requested uh, for it. I've been calling for it, but we are hoping that by middle of uh, this month, that is in the next two weeks, it should be available in Ghana so that you can get a copy and uh, use it to study for your exam. So Comment in the chat box, let me know any questions that you have for me. Uh, and then let me know what you would want us to also cover as well on the channel as we continue with our discussion. Remember to give us a thumbs up on the video when you join the stream. And that way we get more engagement on the video. Okay, so YouTube, I see some of you with a thumbs up on the video. Thank you very much. And comment in the chat box any questions you have for me as we move on to the part two of our discussion on uh, principle of taxation, focusing on value added tax, focusing on value added tax. So yesterday we started a discussion with value added tax and uh, today we want to take it to a step further and look at a couple of uh, things about it. Yesterday we looked at the introduction of value added tax. We mentioned that hey, uh, the tax So I wanted to make sure that my screen is clearer so you guys can see me. Okay, so yesterday we started with value added tax and we defined what value added tax uh, is. We said that, hey, it is a general tax on consumption expenditure, so it's an indirect uh, tax that is charged by uh, the uh, one selling the goods. And we said that it is tax that is uh, charged to the final consumer that is very important in there so it is the final consumer who is going to be paying uh, this tax and then one thing also we mentioned was that it is a tax that is a multi-stage collected so from the date of importation to manufacturing to wholesale to the retail to the final consumer it is collected at each stage of the production cycle and we said that it is a tax that is collected by registered businesses who act as agents of the Ghana Revenue Authority, registered businesses who act as agents of the Ghana Revenue Authority. So that was what we mentioned in relation to uh, that. Then we came to uh, the issue about mechanism, the computation of VAT. Remember, this pro forma is very, very critical because uh, our understanding of value added tax is going to be based on 
our ability to actually understand this uh, pro forma that we have here. So we realize that we bring the value of the goods. That is how much we are selling the goods for. So if, for instance, we are selling the goods for, say, $200 or 200 Ghana cities, since we are in Ghana, let's stay with that. We are selling the goods for 200 Ghana cities. That is the value of the goods. So we're going to charge 2.5% of 200 Ghana cities. Let me grab my calculator. All right, so say 2.5 of 200, and that's about five, okay? So that is five, and that is for the, that is for the uh, NHIL. Then we have another five for the get fund. So we add it up and it becomes 210. So the value of the, the taxable value is 210. So it is on this taxable value that we're going to be charging the VAT of 12%. So 1.25 of 210. And that is giving me 26.5. Okay. 26.25. 26.25. So when we now add that up, that becomes 236.25. All right. 236. 0.25. So that becomes the tax value of the product. All right. That becomes the tax value of the product. And that is very, very critical in relation to that. So this becomes the tax value of the product. So this is what we are going to be paying for the goods that we have bought for the period under consideration. I hope you are getting the workings. Now, the reason why I want you to make sure you understand this pro forma very well is that there is going to be withholding VAT. And there is a withholding VAT, VAT on goods, and that is 7%. And we will look at that in a moment. However, the withholding VAT will be charged on the 210. We will come to that in a moment. But I want you to stay with me carefully here because I want to make sure that we explain this uh, pro forma we have here very well so that you understand what is going on here. So there is going to be withholding VAT. That means if we sold the goods to, or we, yes, we sold the goods to an organization that is a VAT registered organization, then that organization is with, going to withhold 7% of this 210. Because the withholding VAT is on the value of the product inclusive of the VAT, sorry, inclusive of, of NHIL and then the GET fund. And this computation is very, very critical because this is where the examiner can get you at. Where he's asking you, how do you do this? How do you do that? Then, let me also say this. We're going to do this as well later on, though. But uh, remember that when we, uh, there is withholding tax as well, okay? There is a difference between withholding tax and then withholding VAT, okay? There's a difference between withholding tax and withholding VAT. The 7.5% I just mentioned to you is about the withholding what? Tax, Okay? So the withholding tax is going to be the value inclusive of the NHIL. These are registered agents who will collect the VAT, who will withhold the VAT on behalf and remit that directly to the Ghana Revenue Authority. But if there is going to be a withholding tax again, then that withholding tax will be charged basically on the value of the goods. Okay? On the value of the goods, which is going to be the $200. The two hundred dollars. So I hope you are getting the principle very well in relation to how the treatment is going. So that is the pro forma there, and like I said, this pro forma is going to set the pace for us to do a lot of workings later on. And so, if there is anything you're going to be forgetting about value added tax, at least the computation is very very critical because this is going to set the tone for you to be able to understand what it is that is going on in that case. So we spoke about this as well uh, yesterday. So let's go on. And then we spoke about the mechanism of that. Very critical, very critical. We said three things. We said that, hey, you are going to be paying VAT, and that is the VAT, the input VAT. That is what you pay when you buy the resources. Then you're going to be charging VAT, and that is called the output VAT. And so at the end of the year, 
you're going to file your VAT returns. And then we mentioned that if your input VAT, okay, if the input VAT is greater than the output, then the, the difference will be remitted. If your input is greater than your output, meaning you paid more than you received. So what is going to happen is that uh, the tax authority is supposed to remit you. But as you know always, the tax authority is not going to be remitting you, only that we're going to be carrying it forward. However, if your output VAT, meaning that you collected uh, more than you actually paid, then the balancing figure or the difference will be remitted to the revenue authority in that case. So that is what we mentioned about the mechanism of VAT in relation to that. Then we look at uh, the issue in relation to uh, the various amendments that is happening in the Act 2017, Act 948. We spoke about that one as well. So we were on types of supply, and yesterday we discussed all the issues about the uh, taxable supply. We spoke about the place of supply, uh, the time of supply, and you saw how all those things are done and how we deal with those things actually in practice. We deal with those things actually in practice. So we want to move on to the rest of the types of supply, talk about exempt supply, talk about zero-rated supply, talk about relief supply, talk about mixed supply, and then we're going to solve a practice question on how these pieces can actually be put together. I hope you are getting me. Please comment in the chat box any questions that you have uh, for me, what topics uh, you want me to cover on the channel. And then also do well to uh, give us a thumbs up on the video when you join the stream. That way we get more engagement on the video. And YouTube and Facebook will be able to push the video so we can reach as many students as possible as we continue with our discussions on this. So let's move on to exempt supply, exempt supply. We dealt with all these yesterday. Right, so here we are, exempt supply. Now, so when we say an exempt supply, just listen to the name, exempt, exempt. To exempt someone means to what? Prevent the person from getting something. So for instance, if you, uh, did your master's or your uh, uh, first degree and you're applying for the ICA or the ACCA or whatever it is, you're going to be exempted from some papers. It means that even uh, though you're supposed to write them by virtue of your status of your degree, you're going to be exempted. The same idea <laughs> applies when we are dealing with the issue in relation to supplies. And so the next one we want to look at will be exam supply. So when we say a supply is exempted, by, the, by virtue of the name exempt supply, it means it is removed from the VAT Act. It means those kind of supplies aren't going to be subject to the tax or to the VAT law in that case. What does that mean? So let's take the definition. This refers to a supply of goods and services that is not subject to tax. That is the key word there. That is not subject to tax. So the supply of goods and services that is not subject to tax are what we refer to as what? Exempt supplies. Exempt supply. But you've got to be careful about the treatment of all of these things that we are looking at. Because if you are not careful with the treatment, something is going to screw up in there. So look at it. That is that not charged on the sale of exempt supply, but at the same time, no credit may be allowed to the business making SM supply for the VAT paid on purchases. That is very, very important. So no credit may be allowed to the business making SM supplies or SM sales for the VAT paid on purchases of expenses. That is it. So if we are a business, and we'll look at some of them in a moment, but if we are a business and we deal with suppliers that are exempted, then whatever input VAT we paid whilst buying the goods, whilst buying the resources, we are not going to be getting any credit for it. In other words, because you are not charging 
that. So why should we give you any relief? Who should give you that relief? And to what relief can we charge that against? I hope you get the ideology. Because if you're not charging any VAT, and we say we'll give you relief for the input VAT that you pay, then what will you write it off against? There is nothing to write it off. So entities or businesses that engage in exempt supplies or supplies that are exempted will not take any tax credit for the VAT they pay on inputs. That's very important. This means that businesses which make only exempt supplies cannot register for VAT. This means that businesses uh, which make only exempt supplies cannot register for VAT. That's it. So if we are a business or we have an organization and the only thing we do is exempt supply, it means that we cannot what? Register for VAT. Definitely, we cannot register for VAT. That is the thing you need to understand in there. But the question we then ask is, okay, what are some of the things that qualify for this kind of thing? So let's look at some supplies that are specifically exempted. Supplies that are specifically exempted. So the following, now, th this is just a list. It means that it can go beyond or uh, something like that, right? So the following are some of the supplies that are specifically exempt from the, or uh, exempted from the tax uh, laws. We have agricultural inputs. We have water excluding uh, bottled and sachet or uh, packed uh, package water. Electricity within specific limits. Textbooks approved. Uh, textbooks approved uh, supplementary readers, uh, newspapers, charts and others, education services, and laboratory and uh, library equipment for use, medical services and medical supplies, certain pharmaceuticals and active ingredients, machinery and part of machinery designed to use for certain activities, crude oil and hydrocarbon products, auto, uh, sorry, accommodation in a dwelling or land for agricultural use, financial services, goods specifically designed for the disabled. So these are some of the supplies which we can refer to as what? Exempt supply. Okay, these are some of the supplies which we can refer to as exempt supply. But the question we then ask is, why are we exempting these things? Why are we saying that education should be exempted from VAT? In other words, when you are rendering education services or providing education services, you are not supposed to charge VAT because it is outside the VAT is an exempt supply. Why are we saying that? Why are we saying that? When certain goods are designed specifically for uh, disabled people, why do we have to charge that? Because you see, a number of items we have to take into consideration here. There are a couple of social factors that we need to consider here. So let's look at some of the factors or bases or reasons for the exemptions. Factors, bases, or reasons for the exemption. So let's look at some of the points that we have there uh, real quick. Number one, administrative convenience. Administrative convenience. Now, when we say administrative convenience, what are we talking about? This refers to the overriding factors in setting up turnover thresholds to ensure that a manageable number of traders are registered for that. You see, um, when we say everybody should actually pay that, it means that everybody will be paying that, okay? Somebody will be dealing with certain things like um, uh, agricultural inputs, somebody will be running some small education services, somebody who is doing some domestic transport, all of those things. Uh, it's difficult to really uh, put a threshold down for them to fall into the category. So sometimes for administrative convenience and to reduce the burden on these things, we just allow them or we treat them as exempt supply. Then cost effectiveness. There is a little point in bringing into the scope of uh, the class of traders whose contribution to tax revenue will be less than the cost of administration. You know, many of the things that we've mentioned are, are in the informal sector. And probably sometimes, because of location, where some businesses are located, should we say we will go and really 
tax them or charge bad on them. Now, the cost of uh, bringing, uh, going there to take the VAT will be more than the VAT that they actually get it. And remember, one of the principles of taxation or every tax principle, it's economy, meaning that you need to spend less amount of money as compared to the revenue that you are going to collect. So sometimes for cost effectiveness purposes, let's allow them, let them be on their own in relation to that. Third one, record keeping. Many of the businesses which we have listed above don't have the requisite uh, a number of people to really keep proper books of accounts for us to really track what is going on in the organization. For that reason, for that reason, many of them are just treated as exempt supply. Then my favorite area, social and welfare consideration. So imagine you manufacturing a wheelchair and uh, the cost of manufacturing a wheelchair Let's say it's thousand dollars. Okay, let's say it's thousand dollars. That's the cost of manufacturing the wheelchair, and you are putting a VAT on it. Imagine that you are putting a VAT, NHIL, and all of these things on this thing. So let's say you are putting a VAT of twelve point five percent on this. That is going to be one thousand two hundred and fifty. So it tells you that now you're going to be selling this at eleven thousand two hundred and five. 11,250, I guess. 11,250. It is becoming expensive. How can a disabled person buy it? So sometimes for social purposes, okay, to be able to relieve them from whatever pain that they are going through and to help them to be socially or to uh, uh, work well, we take it off. Then education services. Education is a social service. It's a social factor. It shouldn't be expensive for people to have quality education or education. So to some extent, we say that, hey, let, let's just go there and let's look at it in relation to that. Let's just let them go in that case. Then the last thing I have there is technical grounds. Technical grounds. Technical difficulties in defining what is taxable in some types of supply may, be, may necessitate exemption of a given supply. So sometimes on the technical ground, when we look at what the person is doing, when we look at what the person is undertaking, oh, it will be really difficult to actually bring it under the tax uh, scope. So let's just allow them to have their own thing in relation to that. So these are some of the grounds or reasons or basis why certain supplies are treated as exempt supply. Please, the takeaway here is this. Any business or tax person undertaking uh, exempt supply is not qualified to take credit for VAT they paid on their inputs. That is very, very critical. And that is the takeaway I want you to have here. I see a comment coming from Ekia Echan. She said, hello, Ishira. I just want to say thank you for your videos. I passed my exams. Okay. We thank God. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. And congratulations for passing your exams. Wishing you all the best as you uh, go on with your life and take your career to the next level. That is awesome to hear. That is awesome to hear. So comment in the chat box any questions you have for me. Comment in the chat box what topics you want us to cover. Comment in the chat box anything you want me to share my thoughts on, and I will be able to provide you with some assistance on that. Okay, so that is it about exam supply. So what is the takeaway there? These are supplies that are not subject to tax. And businesses that engage in such services or such goods will not also qualify to claim any tax credit on the input VAT they pay for their resources. Okay. Then one of my personal favorites of the types of supplies is this one. Relief supply. Relief supply. Now, I'm, I wanted to make sure you understand what is going on here, especially uh, about that. So let's look at relief supply. Now, this is for institutions and trust and other uh, individuals. So a supply is said to be a relief supply if the transaction is taxable under normal rules, but the status of the taxpayer makes it effectively zero rated. So with relief supply, it is not that 
the goods or the services is not taxable and advanced. It is taxable. However, the status, so the key word here is status. Okay, the key word here is status. So the status of the taxpayer makes it effectively zero rated. So it's free. You don't pay anything on it. You don't pay anything on it. It's going to be free. You don't have to pay anything on that. And that is what we mean by relief supplies. So under normal circumstance, the supply is supposed to be subject to VAT. Under normal circumstance, the person buying is supposed to pay VAT. But the person status makes it zero rated. Now, remember we mentioned that when we talk about a person in tax, we are not just talking about individuals, but we are also talking about what? Organizations, okay? We are also talking about organizations. So that is also something very critical that you need to understand there. So let's see some of the beneficiaries of this one. Definitely the president of the Republic of Ghana, his status makes him uh, to enjoy some of this thing. Commonwealth foreign embassies and missions. However, this one is on reciprocal basis. So the Commonwealth foreign embassies and missions in Ghana, when they are bringing anything on their importation, whatever bad it is they are supposed to pay, we exempt them, they don't pay. But it has to be on a reciprocal basis. What it means is that our embassies in their respective countries are also supposed to be exempted. If they don't exempt us, we too, we don't exempt them. So it is like you scratch my back, I scratch your back for you. So it's on a reciprocal basis. Then other international agencies subject to agreements with the government of Ghana. So other international agencies, like probably World Bank, uh, uh, Danida, um, 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 IMF, any other international organizations or agencies. But they have to write to the government of Ghana and they have to be cleared of any VATs that they are supposed to pay because chances are they are coming to provide us with something, right? Coming to solve a problem, a social amenity issue or uh, 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 something to the individuals. So if we put VAT on it, what the heck? That would be not good for us. Then emergency relief items approved by parliament. That's it, emergency relief item. So like this COVID and we needed those masks, face masks and all of those things. Boom, we've got to take anything off and make it as a relief supply, no VAT is on it. So it means that uh, when parliament, I think this thing has been done, that any organization that deals with uh, anything related to the COVID is not supposed to be paying any VAT when the goods are imported or so. I gotta confirm that though, but uh, that is one thing. So once it is cleared, approved by parliament, when you bring it, you're not gonna pay any part on it because it becomes a relief supply under the scenario. Not that what you are bringing is not subject to the uh, act, not that it's not subject to tax, but because of the conditions surrounding it, why do you want to make it expensive? Like the way the face shield came, I think in the beginning stages, some people were selling it for 60 Ghana cities, 40 Ghana cities. I think I bought my own for, say, 45 Ghana cities. And then now it is like me and some 200, me and some 2,000. Now it's like one city and two city and all of those things. So imagine that there is VAT on it. We don't know why they were selling it at that price. So those things, imagine that we, we put VAT on it again. It becomes expensive and... Remember, we want to reduce the number of people who are going to be contracting the disease. So why not make it as cheap as possible? Let's take out any VAT, and then that will be fine in that case. Then, VAT registered manufacturers for raw materials at importation. So there are certain organizations that also qualify for uh, importation of raw materials for VAT. And to be specific, under the Act 1007, there are some organizations like automobile, organizations and then uh, uh, plant assembly and some other organization they are also exempted from the payment of any uh, VAT concerning the importation of their equipment plants and all of those things in that case so that is also what you need to understand in that but this is the sweet spot if what I'm selling is a taxable supply and I'm supposed to tax you or charge you VAT but your status makes it that I can't charge you VAT. At the end of the day, what do I tell the Commissioner General? 
Stay with me carefully. What I'm selling is subject to VAT. I am supposed to charge you VAT when I sell it to you. But your status makes it zero rated. So I can't charge you VAT when I'm selling it to you. But to enhance accountability and to be able to claim uh, returns for whatever VAT input that I've paid, something has to be done. It is for this reason why there is what is called the VAT relief purchases order. The VAT relief purchases order. Now, this is what happens. This is what happens. I will explain the principle to you that you get the idea about that. Anybody who is, remember, before you can be a relief institution or organization, you should apply, right? So you should apply to the Commissioner General in writing, and the Commissioner General will approve. Once the Commissioner General approves that, the Commissioner General is going to be um, issuing to you what is called the VAT Relief Purchases Order. And this is what happens. So let's say you apply. Maybe you have an NGO that's, uh, that's what? Deals with uh, women on the streets, something like that. And you'll be importing some goods up and then you say that, hey, or you'll be buying goods and when you buy the goods, you are giving it to them. So it's a charity thing. So you don't want to pay VAT. So you write to the Commissioner General and you are cleared up. This is what happens. When I sell to you, anytime you buy from a VAT registered agent, you will issue the VAT relief purchases order, which will cover the VAT component that you should have paid to me. Are you getting the principle? So, if for instance, so let's correct some numbers here. So, let's say the goods that I'm selling to you, it say $3,000. Okay, $3,000. So, let's say the VAT 1.25 times 3,000, that's 375. So the VAT is 375. So technically I'm supposed to uh, take an amount of 3,375 from you. Now stay with me carefully here. This is what you are supposed to give to me. But because we are a relief person, because your organization is a relief organization, the Ghana Revenue Authority will give you what is called the VAT Relief Purchases Order. So that anytime you buy from me, you will only pay. You will only pay the three thousand. Then you will issue to me the VAT relief purchases order. You will issue to me that will cover the three seven five. The idea is that when I'm now filing my VAT returns to with the Commissioner General, the Commissioner General will ask me, "Hey, insurer." You sold goods for 3000 You were supposed to collect VAT of 375 Then I said, oh, somebody came and the person said he is a relief person, so I didn't charge VAT. The Ghana Revenue Authority doesn't know that. He will take his money. Commissioner General will take his money. So to avoid that conflict, when you issue the VAT relief purchase order document to me, I attach it to my returns. And then, when I'm filing the returns, it will see. So that the Commissioner General will know that, oh, okay, I didn't actually collect this VAT because this sales was given to a relief organization. This is how the VAT relief purchase for that thing work. I hope it makes sense. Comment in the chat box any questions you have for me and make sure you understand the principle very well of how this thing works. Of how this thing works. So let's see. So look at the procedure. What I just explained, look at the procedure here. So one, a taxable person applies to the Commissioner General for the granting of the relief status. Then number two, taxable person is given the VAT relief purchase order booklet by the Commissioner General upon the approval of application. Number three, the relief person issued the VRPO to the VAT trader from whom he makes taxable supplies, indicating the taxable supply plus the VAT, which is covered by the VRPO. Then the relief person pays the amount invoice, excluding the VAT, and issues a VRPO to cover the VAT element, like I told you here. So you are supposed to give me 3000 you are supposed to give me 3,375. 
But because we're a relief organization, you will pay me only the 3000 So you issue the tax invoice for me, that will cover the bad component of what? 375. This is what we are talking about here. This is what we are talking about here. Then, number five, the taxable person files his monthly returns using the VRPO to account for the VAT relief. To account for the VAT relief. So that is what is happening here when we deal with the issue about relief supply. Relief supply. Now, look at uh, something I want you to note here very well. This is very important to me. So make sure you get it well. The Commissioner General of VAT or the Commissioner of VAT, sorry, issues a VAT relief purchase order for relief for payment of VAT to local purchases on local purchases to institutions and bodies, on local purchases to institutions and bodies with legitimate title to release from the payment of domestic VAT. However, VRPO does not entitle the holder to relief from VAT on entertainment, hotel accommodation, and restaurant meals and personal expenses. Very, very critical. Very, very critical. The fact that you have a VRPO does not mean that it's your birthday. Yes, you run an NGO, then it's your birthday. Then you're organizing birthday and you go and take a hotel, then you are doing birthday party. Then when you finish, they give you the bill, then they are giving a VRPO. Are you? What was that? So that is not covered by the tax law. Okay, the VRPO, the holder is not, is not. That is the key thing entitled to benefit from any of those things in there. I hope you are getting the principle. So that is what you need to understand when we talk about the relief supply. That is what you need to understand when we talk about relief supply. Any questions, please comment in the chat box for me. If you have any questions, there is something you did not understand, you can uh, copy. Uh, let me know. And then let's look at that real quick. So YouTube, give us a thumbs up on the video when you join the live stream. Uh, that way we get more engagement on the video, as you know, always. Okay, so I see some of you with a thumbs up on the video. Thank you very much. And then share the video as well, if you can, which you should be able to uh, with added so we can reach as many students as possible on the live stream and assist more students preparing for the exams. All right. That's very, very important. We cannot overemphasize that. So let's go to the next one, and that is going to be what? Zero rated supply. So relief supply, exempt supply, okay? Relief supply, that one is out. Exempts, uh, sorry, relief, exempt supply, it's outside. But relief supply, the thing is taxable, but the status of the person makes it zero rated technically so let's look at the fourth one zero rated supply this one is uh, one 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 thing that we need to understand why should you make it zero rated can't you just make it a uh, relief or agent so we go away in that case but it's very critical for us to understand so look at it zero rated supply this refers to the supply of goods and services whose output tax shall be zero. So as the name suggests, these are goods and services whose output tax shall be zero. That is it. That is, the rate of VAT is zero. It's very, very important you need to understand this. So with taxable supply, the rate is what? 12.5%. With exam supply, that supply is not even subject to tax in the first place. With relief supply, it is subject to tax, 12.5%. However, the status of the person buying the goods or receiving the service makes it zero rated. So with 
relief supply, there is a VAT component. And now, the uh, person buying the goods will issue to you the VRPO invoice. However, with zero rated, these are supplies and the VAT rate is zero. And zero cannot multiply anything. So technically, it means it is zero. I'll be getting it. So technically, it means it's going to be zero. So what are some of the things that we need to uh -oh, understand here? So let's see. So under the VAT Act, the following supplies destined for consumption outside the territory, the territory boundaries of Ghana are zero rated. So the following are some supplies that we can refer to as zero rated. Export of goods and services, including from free zone, under the Free Zones Act. Goods shipped at stores on vessels and aircraft leaving Ghana. Transportation of passengers on vessels on aircraft leaving Ghana. Supply to a free zone developer or free zone enterprise in compliance with the requirement of the Free Zone Act. Transfer of a going concern that is supply of goods as part of a transfer of business as a going concern by one taxable person to another taxable person. And the list uh, goes on in that case. The list goes on in that case. So that is also what you need to understand when we talk about zero rated supply. When we talk about zero rated supply. Now, the following institutions shall be approached for recommendation before seeking relief from the VAT service. And this is under uh, relief uh, supply that uh, I didn't arrange my slide well on that. So this one should have come before that. But that is something you need to understand. If it is mining related, you go to the mineral commissions. Pharmaceuticals, you go to the Food and Drug Authority. Telecommunication firms who want to be relieved from the payment of VAT, you can reach the National Commission, the Communication Authority because you need to reach the National Communication Authority first, then you can now write to the Ghana Revenue Authority. So you don't just get up and go there and say, hey, relieve me from death. Agriculture and fishing definitely go to the Ministry of Minister, yeah, Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Veterinary drugs, definitely Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and then the veterinary department. Agrochemicals, you go to the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, as well as the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. So that is also what we need to understand about that. Now, before we look at the last type of supply, it will be very important for us to draw some distinctions between exempt supply and zero rated supply, because it looks like the same thing. Because at the end of the day, you're not paying anything. At the end of the day, you're not charging anything, but you've got to be careful about how the distinction actually works. You gotta be careful about the thin line between these two guys. Even though they may look alike, they aren't the same. So let's look at some of the differences between exempt supply and relief supply. So let's look at some differences between these two guys. So under exempt supply, what do we see there? We see that the transaction are, or the transactions are not what? Taxable. That is the key thing there. Exempt supply, the thing by itself is not taxable. But with the zero rated supply, it is taxable. Only that the rate is zero. zero. So that's the first difference. With exempt supply, the thing is not taxable to start to mention. But with zero rated supply, it is taxable. However, the rate is zero. The rate is zero. Number two, with exam supply, and like we mentioned earlier, it falls outside the scope of the VAT. But with zero rated supply, it falls exactly within the scope. It falls exactly within the scope. That is very, very important in relation to that. Then three, exam supply. Dealers in exam supply cannot recover any input tax in care. Dealers in exempt supplies cannot recover any input tax 
incurred. So whatever input tax they incurred cannot take it. And we mentioned this already. However, with zero rated, I didn't say you should do it zero rated. I didn't say you should treat those supplies as zero rated. You, the law, said it. So with those ones, we said that, but we say that dealers in zero rated supplies may recover input taxes in tech. So here, there is an option for us to be able to recover for the input tax that we have in tech. Then the last thing definitely we can talk about is that exempt supplies may involve local and foreign supplies. Exempt supplies may involve local and foreign supplies. However, zero rated supplies are generally deemed to be outside Ghana, to be outside Ghana. So when the things are being taken outside of Ghana, then we can uh, bring the issue in relation to zero rated uh, supply in there. So these are the four differences that we can talk about when we are explaining the principle of taxable supply, sorry, exempt supply and what? Zero rated supply. One is taxable at a rate of zero. One is not taxable. One is within the scope. The other is outside the scope. The dealers in one may claim any input tax. The dealers in another may not claim any input tax. The dealers, uh, uh, the, uh, one relates to generally goods deems to go outside of Ghana, while the other may include both local and foreign supplies. These are the things you need to understand when we talk about the issue in relation to exempt supply and zero rated supplies. So let me know if there are any questions. If there are any things that you don't understand that you want me to um, clarify real quick before we continue with the last one. And I see some of you joining the stream. Welcome. And consider to give us a thumbs up on the video. That way we get more engagement on it. And uh, YouTube will be able to make the video reach as many uh, people as possible and certainly on Facebook because we are streaming as well on Facebook so and you can consider to share the video as well so that we can uh, reach many students so let's look at the last part of these supplies and that is mixed supply mixed supply so we look at taxable supply exempt supply relief supply, and then um, zero rated supply, zero rated supply. The next thing we want to look at is mixed supply, mixed supply. As the name suggests, it means it is mixed, right? It means it is mixed. What, what are we talking about here? This is a supply of goods and services, which are a combination of items of some of which are taxable at the standard rate of 12.5%, as well as items which are exempt. So this is where the supply is, including some exempt supplies and including some taxable supply. So when some of them can be taxed at the standard rate and others are exempt supply, we say that that kind of supply is referred to as well, mixed supply, mixed supply. Now, the supplier is expected to account for tax separately, except where it is difficult to do so, generally where the items involved are of composite nature. So, if it's a mixed supply, you're supposed to separate it out. You got it? It makes sense, right? You're supposed to just separate it out. So, how much was a mixed supply? You bring it up. You bring it up. So, maybe we bought goods from you, and you sell some goods, and then uh, because of our status, partly maybe we bought something worth thirty thousand uh, dollars, thirty thousand or thirty thousand Ghana cedis. So let's say that when we divide this into two, um, about twenty six thousand of that, okay, is a relief supply, 
and then only 4,000 of that is an exam supply, and then only 4,000 of that is a taxable supply. What we're saying here is that for tax purposes, we are supposed to account for them all separately, separately. Because this is an exam supply, you account for it separately, and then this is a relief supply, you account for that as well separately. However, if it is a comp, the asset or the item is of a composite nature, where we can break the various components of the transaction up, then certainly we are going to be just uh, treating it as either. Sometimes it depends on the uh, judgment of the commissioner. It could be treated as a taxable supply or as an exempt supply. So these are the five types of supplies that you need to understand. And they are various treatments, okay? The five types of supplies that you need to understand and they are various treatments. Now, we've spoken about the issue about inputs and output VAT already, okay? So I'm not gonna be going into that uh, in that case. So let's discuss real quick on uh, tax credits and refunds. Very, very important about this uh, aspect of the syllabus. Remember we said that uh, if we engage in taxable supplies, then whatever input VAT we pay, we are going to uh, be charging output VAT. Then at the end of the year, we file our VAT returns and then we're going to be claiming a deduction for the input VAT we pay. Unless otherwise we are dealing with exempt supply, where any input VAT we pay will not be subject to, or uh, we will not get credit for it. So let's look at the rules uh, for claiming input tax in Ghana. The rules for claiming input tax in Ghana. So let me grab a red ink there. So one, no input tax credit may be claimed on purchase and expenses relating to exempt supplies. We've already mentioned this. So as far as the thing is an exempt supply, I mean, where are you going to claim it from? So you don't claim it anything because it's not available. That's the first thing. Second, no tax input cre uh, credit may be claimed more than once. I mean, if we, do, if we don't do that, people will claim more than once. So it's just claimable for once a time. Three, if a taxable person makes both taxable and exempt supply, the input tax should be allocated between those two types of supply. It is only the input tax relating to the taxable portion of the supply that can be reclaimed. And we just mentioned this. Because with exempt supplies, you can't claim any input tax on it. You can only claim the input tax on what? Taxable supplies. So when somebody deal, uh, undertake a mixed supply, what we are saying here is that if we can separate it into the uh, taxable component and then the exempt component, then you will only receive or claim an input tax on the taxable component in relation to that. Then the last one is, no input tax can be taken in respect of entertainment. We've mentioned that uh, as well in that case. So these are some of the rules governing taxation in Ghana. Now, let me talk about something very, very important here. Something very, very important here. Yes, you can claim the tax, but there is a, an exception on what is claimable. There is a limit on what is claimable. So you've got to be careful here. So look at the note I have here, this note. This note. I want you to pay attention to what we are coming to uh, discuss under these two uh, points that I have here. And this is very critical. So make sure you catch it very well. A VAT registered business, which principally makes taxable supply, may recover up to 100% of the VAT incurred on goods and services purchases for the business, subject to meeting certain conditions. We've mentioned that already. So you may claim 100% of all your tax inputs, as far as they are taxable supplies. But this is where the key thing comes in. Look at what I bought in here in my slide. Let me bring it up a little bit. Let me zoom it up a little bit. So look at it. 
the 2.5% NHIL and the 2.5% GET Fund levy are, however, not recoverable as an input tax deduction against output tax. Uh oh. So you gotta be careful here. You gotta be really, really careful here. Now, if you remember our computation earlier, you will understand why this statement is being made here. So let me just take you a little back to our slide in the beginning to the pro forma. Let's see. Look at the pro forma here. Look at the pro forma. This is what we mentioned here. So look at it. The VAT is not charged on the value of the product. Instead, the VAT is charged on the taxable value, which is inclusive of your NHIL and then the get fund levy. For that reason, you are claiming VAT on what you actually paid exclusive of what? I'm oh, sorry, inclusive of the NHIL and then the 2.5 uh, get fund levy. That's very, very critical. That is very, very critical. So you got to make sure that you understand this in the computation. In the computation. Because these things are all the principles. Now, when we put you on the spot to do the calculations to present the work in total, that is where you really see the principles in a bigger picture in that case. So let's go back there. I have bypassed the place already, I guess. Yep. So let's take that line again. The 2.5 NHRL levy and the 2.5 get fund levy are, however, not recoverable as input tax deduction against output tax. Previously, it was computation was done differently, but now that is not what we do. So you got to be careful about that. Then there is a time limit of six months within which to claim VAT in care of goods and services procured. So these two principles are actually going to be setting the tone for VAT computation. For VAT computation. And it's very, very critical for you to understand these and then note them down very well in that case. Any questions for me, please, real quick? Any questions for me? Any questions for me? Let's see if I have some questions coming up or some comments coming up here. Okay. All right, so now that we have uh, discussed the issue in relation to um, the types of supplies, let's dive a bit deeper to look at some few uh, principles that we need to understand. There are a couple of things I'm going to be skipping. Um, in that case, and then I'll just point out some salient issues as well. Now, remember I told you about the 3% uh, flat scheme, and I think uh, Ebenezer yesterday was asking some questions about that uh, as well, and uh, I spoke about this, but it's, uh, I've also included it in my slide here, so let's just run through it real quick about uh, that. So the VR, VFRS is a special method of collecting and accounting for VAT and NHIL. It is designed for traders operating in a retail sector. Under this system, the registered retailer of tangible goods shall charge VAT NHIL at a marginal rate of 3% on the value of each tangible item. 
on the value of each taxable item. It is simpler to operate blah, blah, blah. We know what, whatever it is that he's going to be talking about. So look at how that works. Very simple. So with that one, all we do is, okay, what is the taxable amount we're talking about? So maybe the taxable amount we're talking about is probably, let's say something we are selling is 40,000 cities. So instead of charging NHIL 2.5%, get fund 2.5%, add it up to get your taxable value, then you come and charge 12%. Mm -mm. You just charge a standard rate of EBASI 3%. And 3% of that, what do we have? Of 0.03 by 40,000, then that is 1,200. So it means that this is what I'm going to pay if I'm buying from such a person, and that is 41,200. Okay, 41,200. 41,200. And that is the idea there. This is the 3% flat rate system okay and remember what we said we mentioned that the retailers or businesses that are using this or we should be using this flat rate system don't qualify to claim any input tax because everything has technically been worked on so that is all that is all everything has technically been worked on so you don't collect anything in that case Then we need to ask ourselves a couple of uh, questions about dealing with the issue in relation to the VAT. And that question is, who can register for VAT? And what are the threshold rules for registration? So I want you to stay with me carefully here. This is another bomb area that you need to understand. That examiner could throw a job at you there. So you got to make sure that you understand this very well as we proceed with our discussions. So we've said this already, that VAT is collected only by business enterprises as agents who collect the tax on behalf of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Okay? I use the word internal revenue services. That's a generic word uh, because in other countries, it's not just Ghana. So that is why you see IRS there, but it will be Ghana Revenue Authority. So registration requirements. Except as otherwise, it should be except, not exempt. So except as otherwise provided in this act, a person who is engaged in a taxable activity and is not registered for tax purposes shall register if... So this is the condition for registration. So somebody accepts the person is exempted, like the person is dealing with relief supplies, we know that the person cannot register for VAT, right? Because if they are dealing with uh, exempt supplies, then you cannot. If you are dealing with exempt supplies, then you cannot register. So except that or except otherwise somewhere else in this act, anyone, anyone engaging in taxable activities and is not registered shall register if A, at the end of any period of 12 months or less, the person made during that period taxable supplies exceeding 200,000 Ghana cities. That's the threshold. So in 12 months or less than 12 months, this is how much money you're going to be making. So if that is the sales you're going to be generating, hey, you're making a lot of money, man. Come register and collect some money for us. Or at the end of any month, there are reasonable grounds to expect that that person will make, expect that that person will make taxable supplies in the next 12 months or less exceeding 200,000. So either you are making 200,000 or more already, or 
you expect that in the next 12 months or less, you're going to be making 200,000 or more. You're going to be making 200,000 or more. But the law is a bit generous because uh, sometimes I may not be making that money, but I still want to register. And we will look at the benefits of registration in a moment because somebody will say, ah, if I'm operating and I'm not getting 200,000, why should I go and register for VAT? There are a lot of benefits for registered businesses who register for VAT and collect VAT on behalf of the government. And we'll look at that in a moment. For that reason, there is what is called group registration. Group registration. So that is the C aspect. Group registration is possible, but subject to approval of a written application by members of the proposed group of businesses. So probably I'm selling something. Let's give an example. Let's say that uh, maybe I have a shop and I deal with sanitary parts. Let's say you have a shop and you are selling, uh, what will you sell? Maybe you are selling chocolates and then maybe uh, uh, somebody also has a shop and the person is selling whatever. Uh, let's say drinks or within cloth, but then each of us, our sales is not 200,000 in a year, man. That's a huge amount of money, but we don't have it. So we can come together and form a group. Then we will write to the Commissioner General and say, hey, we as a group want to register to collect VAT on behalf of the Revenue Authority. And the Commissioner General will look at the letter, assess the members in the proposed group, and decide whether they can register or they cannot. So that is also the issue about the group registration. Now, even though this is what the tax law says, anybody making revenue or making money more than 20, 200,000, or if you expect to make 200,000 in the next 12 months or less, you've got to register, or you can register as a group, there are certain types of businesses or tax persons who are required by the tax law to register whether they like it or not. And that is what we refer to as obligatory registration. Obligatory registration. Obligatory registration. The VAT Act imposes on the following category, categories of business all obligations to all obligated all obligated to register to charge the tax. So as far as you are in this kind of industry, in this kind of businesses, in this kind of categories, you've got to register. Even if you don't want to register, you've got to register. Even if you're not getting the 200,000 thing, you still got to register because you've got to charge a 3% for us so we can get some money for the government. So one, manufacturers. So cement, etc. Service providers, also there. Wholesalers and then retailers of goods exceeding, if I say, 10K. Exceeding 10K. So, I mean, 10K, you can make 10K within a year. As I, if I'm selling sanitary parts, you are selling chocolate, and someone is also selling uh, uh, within, I mean, 10K within a year, you should be able to make that, or a month, you should be able to uh, make that. So these categories of businesses are obligate, obligated to uh, register for VAT. Then the last thing is what we call voluntary registration. So a retailer whose threshold fall below the registration threshold may voluntarily apply to be registered as a taxable person unless the Commissioner General A is satisfied that the person has no fixed place of abode or business, or the Commissioner General has reasonable grounds to believe that the person may not keep proper <laughs> books of accounts, the person may not submit regular and reliable tax returns as required, the person is not fit or a proper person to be registered, or the person is trading exclusively in what? Exempt supply. So, if I have a fixed place of business, I'm going to keep proper books of account, certainly. I will submit or uh, uh, provide the tax returns. Remember, these are all in the judgments of the Commissioner General, okay? So you can't decide to, for him. 
if he looks at the report, he looks at the person, uh, they look at the things and they realize that, oh, this person is uh, not going to do a lot of work. Because remember, if you don't keep proper books of account, chances are people may collect the facts and keep the money. And that is what we want to avoid here. We don't want people to collect the money and keep it. They have to collect it and take it to the government at the end of the day, take it to the revenue authority. So to avoid that, we have to make sure that we have people who are going to keep proper books of accounts, who will submit regular and reliable tax returns. Very, very critical. So these are the things that you need to understand when it comes to dealing with registration, when it comes to dealing with registration. So any questions for me real quick? I'm going to be concluding around here today because of time's sake. Uh, I have a class this evening uh, in, in the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to conclude here today. That is the part two on the principles of taxation, value added tax to be specific. And God willing, tomorrow we will look at the final part of this and uh, we will discuss the issue in relation to how we can do the computation, okay? How we calculate the VAT, how we deal with the withholding VAT. So that is where the thing is going to be tomorrow. So make sure that you join me same time tomorrow, 16.30 GMT or 4.30 PM as we continue with our discussion towards the ICE in November 2020 examination. It's always a privilege coming your way and I'm always excited coming your way and providing you with some assistance in here. Now, remember, for those of you uh, who are watching, that uh, our special offer of 325 Ghana cities per paper to study directly under my mentorship for the ICA November 2020 examination is still uh, available. What it means is that you can register uh, for a paper at 325, get access to our e-books, get access to lecture videos on our study portal, and most importantly, uh, join our weekly Zoom sessions and study directly under my mentorship for the ICA November 2020 examination. So you can call 050 the number you see uh, scrolling on your screen, 050 You can call or WhatsApp that line and we will be able to uh, assist you so you can register, join the group, and then study under my mentorship. So thank you very much for joining the stream, all of you guys who uh, join the stream and we'll be watching the playback as well on YouTube as well as on Facebook same time tomorrow 4 30 p.m. or 16 uh, 30 GMT I'll be coming uh, your way as we continue with our discussion so you stay blessed you take care of yourselves and uh, I'll see you same time tomorrow on the live stream in that case so all the best and bye-bye